It is estimated that one in three black males will go to prison at some point in their lifetime. This means that if I have just two friends, statistically one of us will end up in jail. This also means that many of the fathers, uncles, cousins, brothers, and friends of black male youth will at some point be removed from their stories. The question that then arises is how will we fill those gaps? Who will answer the questions that exist in those voids when the 38% of black children living at or below the poverty line decide that they want better than their circumstance? Who will they call on? How can we ensure that they too exist in a kingdom that will allow them to encounter the lives they envision for themselves being lived by someone they resemble? What generally happens to the 60% of black males that start but don't finish college? Maybe they fall into that one in three. I ask because I serve as a resident assistant for 50 residents that identify as African-American males, and as I walk down the hallway and have conversations, as I see the discipline and the study habits of these young men, I refuse to believe only 20 of them are expected to graduate. I pose these questions and these statistics not to reiterate what many of us already know, but instead to focus on a side of the statistics that we often forget to mention. There is a black boy somewhere that dreams of being a doctor. Another that hopes to be an architect of the world's next wonder. Someone else that dreams of helping his community by being a police officer or politician. But what happens when none of their dreams exist in relatable forms within their community? Should they just give up? What happens when they do? Are we telling the 38% at or below the poverty line to grab their own bootstraps and make their dreams come true? While one in three is a number that is truly outrageous, it does mean that two-thirds of black males will never see the inside of a jail cell. Somewhere in that two-thirds there exists a black male doctor, while 60% of any group starting but not completing their college coursework is far too high, it does leave 40% that obtain a college degree. Somewhere in that 40% there exists a black male architect or mayor. We have seen these gaps filled in pockets throughout history. We have started various efforts and initiatives aimed at decreasing the incarceration rate and increasing the retention and graduation rates of black males. All of which have done great work in their own rights. But there is still significant work to be done. There is still work when black children make up 31% of school-related arrests. There is still work when the unemployment rate for black males between the ages of 16 and 19 is 21.9%. There is still work when the black-white income gap is $26,000. Four years ago, I celebrated my high school graduation. At the same time, I also prepared for my first year of college and thus began to consider potential majors and career aspirations. In the process of taking steps towards this next phase of my life, many people offered both congratulations as well as gifts and words of advice I still carry with me to this day. One of the gifts that was offered was a package of journals. These journals were wrapped with a note reading something to the effect of, finding my voice allowed me to find my way Hopefully, sharing your story will allow you to do the same. Four years later, each of these journals are filled with notes, thoughts, ideas, and memories that capture this roller coaster also referred to as college. But regardless of the twists and turns, I stand here just a few weeks away from graduation, thanks largely in part to the various pens that touch the pages, bounded together into the journals I almost forgot to pack but also thanks to a mentor unafraid to share his story, hoping it would allow me to build upon my own. During my first year here at the University of Connecticut, the majority of these journal entries took the form of spoken word poetry pieces that I wrote and performed around campus. One of the pieces I entitled Letter to My Unborn Son, and in it I stated, Dear son, I want you to know that I began planning for you well before I began planning for you. I hope that one day I can find my Eve and plant your seed in the Garden of Eden. I want to paint a picture. 
but not the way life is pictured. Instead, the way I picture life for you. You see, I'm still trying to set this scene, uh, establish a kingdom before I raise a king. At the time, I did not know what I wanted or even what I envisioned this kingdom to look like. And so I looked to my own upbringing. I began to study and explore the kingdom for which my parents had built for me. A kingdom that could not have made the impact it has without significant levels of investment and sacrifice. I reflected not only on the concerted cultivation that took place when they helped me with my homework or when they signed me up for extracurricular activities or when they took active roles in parent-teacher conferences, but I also found myself looking closely at the various elders that were a part of this kingdom. The individuals that played the roles of coaches, mentors, and extended family that became a part of my circle. In these individuals, I could find answers to questions, support when things did not go as planned, advice when the next step was unclear, and guidance when what I knew was not enough. I would thus consider myself one of the lucky ones. I was blessed with parents that did all they could to ensure that I reached my fullest potential. And although their guidance, wisdom, and faith have shaped me, I am forever grateful that they were not selfish. I say this as a first-generation student and in a few weeks graduate, understanding that the various questions I held about college, about careers, and about life as a whole were not answered in isolation. They were answered by my kingdom, by coaches after practice, by family friends through text, by strangers that became mentors because my parents were not concerned with answering every question or filling every gap themselves, just making sure that they were filled. I stand here with no all-encompassing solution, just a challenge to all those that reflect the dreams and aspirations as well as those that see the potential of black boys everywhere to take the time to fill those gaps. We have so many future leaders, teachers, doctors, and and heroes just waiting for their questions to be answered, just waiting to edit the blueprint to their futures. Every day, we have an opportunity to work to change that one in three, but it certainly will require work. The spoken word I referenced earlier goes on to say, son, I hope that you were listening. This was just your first lesson, and although I may not teach you, you will learn the rest later. Let us go now and respond to the curiosity of our future leaders and our future heroes. Thank you.